All right, we, I'm gonna keep us moving in the interest of time. And uh, today we are gonna be talking about voting. And our goal really today with this meeting um, is to motivate you and get you guys on board with us to help mobilize the vote in Northern Manhattan. There was a lot at stake during this November election, and it is crucial that we not only vote, but that we get out there and we encourage others to vote because of all the things that are at stake. To reach our goal today, we have three main objectives. We want to make sure that we educate and inform you on the essential voting guidelines for the upcoming November 3rd election. We want to make sure that we expose the connections between voting and environmental justice issues. And finally, we want to recruit you to be a part of our 2020 and 2021 voter engagement campaign. Today is just, we're having so many tech problems for some odd reason, but don't worry, I'm gonna keep us going. So right now I just wanna quickly run through our agenda for the meeting. We just went through our welcome. We have a dynamic keynote speaker and former coworker of mine. From the, legal from the Legal Defense Fund who will be speaking about the historical context of voting rights, um, disenfranch voting rights um, disenfranch disenfranchisement, um, and really is on the front line of making sure people of color, African Americans in particular, have the ability to participate in the political process. We also have a dear friend of mine Haley from the New York Lawyers, New York Lawyers Public Interest, who will be doing a Know Your Rights presentation to make sure that you know how to address any challenges you may come across at the voting booth. And then finally, you will hear from my coworker, Christopher Casey, who will review our 2020 and 2021 voter engagement campaign. And, the, and then we will close, as we always do, with announcements, upcoming events, and a reminder for you to become a WEAC member. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker. His name is Duel Ross. He is the senior counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Dual uses litigation, public education, and other advocacy strategies to ensure that Black people have equal access to, political, to the political process and to the educational opportunities. And without further ado, please give a round of applause to my dear friend and trailblazer in the voting rights movement, Duel Ross. Hi, thank you, Marquise, and thank you, everyone. So uh, I appreciate being invited to speak to you all today. I'd like to just, you know, give an a overview of sort of the history of voting in America and then also talk about its connections to uh, environmental justice mm -hmm. and sort of what's going on right now in the context of, of voting rights and why it's so important for the 2020 elections, which I think no one needs me to... Uh, to, to say how important the 2020 election is, but I think it's, it's probably helpful for you all to hear a little bit about at least what I do and how that, um, you know, interacts with what other folks are concerned about, particularly the pandemic and whatnot. So um, as Marquise said, I'm an attorney at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Uh, the work that the Legal Defense Fund does in the voting space has been, uh, you know, some of the most important work of the last 80 years, as long as LDF has been around. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I, I'm sort of struck by as I'm sitting here and listening to you all speak is that when we talk about um, the right to vote, 
um, and its sort of impact on, on other issues, you know, the right to vote is sort of the fundamental right in American democracy, right? The Supreme Court has said that for over 100 years. And the reason why is because it affects so many other things, right? If you can't vote, you can't influence your uh, local legislators, you can't influence the president, you can't influence Congress, you can't, uh, you don't have as much power as you could otherwise to change things. And part of that is, is something that folks have known for a long time, right? So this year is not only a presidential election, but the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, the 15th Amendment uh, prohibited racial discrimination in voting. And for a long time, neither of those amendments meant a lot for people of color. And so functionally, what that meant was that Black people uh, in particular, but other people of color were disenfranchised. And some one of the things that sort of when I uh, talk a little bit about uh, history of voting rights is people ask, like, what came first, right? Was it disenfranchisement or was it Jim Crow? And the answer is it was Jim, it was disenfranchisement, right? So if people couldn't vote, it didn't matter uh, what you said, and therefore it was okay for the legislatures and others to disenfranchise you in other ways, right? To create segregated communities, to create uh, segregated schools, and to create the Jim Crow. Oh, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. To create the sort of Jim Crow system uh, that we uh, have been living with since um, the 1800s. And one of the results of that Jim Crow system is not just um, the, the sort of racism that we're dealing with in the context of voting rights nowadays, but it's also a uh, segregation in terms of where people live, right? Um, what happened, as I think you guys probably all know, is that once you disenfranchise Black people at the local level uh, and create sort of the Jim Crow system, you also see it at the federal level, right? In the 1930s and 1940s, and Black people were still largely disenfranchised, the federal government also participated in redlining and other forms of uh, residential segregation, encouraging people basically to, uh, in some instances, many instances, forcing people to live alone uh, and doing engaging in things like um, redevelopment plans that were largely focused on our revitalization plans, as they call it, but really were often uh, referred to colloquially as Negro removal plans, right? So the idea that, um, you know, you could basically displace entire communities and further racial segregation and discrimination by uh, also moving white people out of the city and into the suburbs and subsidizing that on the federal level. And what that means for today, at least from my perspective and, and hopefully how it connects you all, is that that is sort of the origins of a lot of the environmental issues that we see in communities of color, right? So if you segregated people off into these sort of uh, communities that people don't uh, necessarily care about and don't necessarily have a lot of um, resources, then it's easy for you to put some, uh, you know, to put a, a dumping ground there, right? Or to, in the instance of a case I'm working on in Louisiana right now, to put a Formosa plant uh, a chemical plant a mile away from a 100% black school, right? Because the people in that community uh, don't have a voice, don't have a say in their local government. Um, and so, you know, that sort of brings us up to at least what I hope is today, right? Um, a, and what we're seeing today in particular in the context of voting rights is a lot of um, new forms of old discrimination, right? So, in 2013, the Supreme Court of the United States uh, issued a decision called Shelby County versus Holder, in which the Supreme Court effectively gutted a portion of the Voting Rights Act, which was known as Section 5 preclearance. I won't bore you guys with the details of that, but the, the short version is, is that states with a history of discrimination, primarily in the South, but also some parts of New York City, uh, some parts of California, some parts of Michigan, and uh, all of South Dakota, Alaska, um, all of those jurisdictions, Arizona had to uh, seek permission from the federal government before they uh, enacted any new voting law. So that was something as small as changing a polling location from one side of the street to another, to something as big as passing a new voter ID law or congressional redistricting or something like that. Um, and when the Supreme Court stepped in in 2013 and basically said, you're not, uh, stopped uh, 
the Congress, sorry, the Department of Justice and Congress from enforcing that provision of the Voting Rights Act. What it means, what it meant was, is that states, primarily in the South, but also in the North, sort of unleashed this torrent of uh, racially discriminatory voting rules, right? So in Alabama, where I litigate a lot of my cases, um, what happened was the state had passed a voter photo ID law in 2011, but didn't actually enforce it until the Supreme Court came down with its decision saying that um, this law no longer had to be pre-cleared. Um, and the origins of Alabama's voter ID law are particularly egregious. The people who had sponsored it for 15 years had openly said that the purpose of the law was to undermine the state's black power structure um, and that the law was uh, meant to basically disenfranchise African Americans. Um, and despite all that, the state still went forward with enforcing it. Uh, in other states, you see sort of even more egregious or similarly egregious examples, right? In Texas, the law had actually, the, their photo ID law had actually been blocked before 2013 by both federal courts and the Department of Justice. And then immediately after the Shelby County decision came down, Texas said, we're going to go forward with uh, enforcing this law, despite three judges and uh, the Department of Justice saying that they were, uh, the law was racially discriminatory. Uh, and so litigation ultimately led to that law being shut down. So that's sort of a, a very broad 100 foot view overview of voting rights and what I hope is uh, a connection to what the work that you all are doing. And I'm happy to maybe answer a few questions and, and talk a little bit more specifically if, if folks are interested. But um, it also brings us to today, right? So I'm sure a lot of you all are hearing about uh, the 2020 elections and how to vote and how safely to vote and what to do to vote. Um, you know, and there are really a couple of things going on, right? So one is how do people vote? Um, just in general, right? How do you make sure that your ballot is counted? How do you know where to go? How do you uh, know what forms of ID you have or when you need to be registered and things like that? And there's a second layer, which I think is sort of overarching. It's why we're all on a Zoom call rather than in person, right? Is the coronavirus. Um, and so what has happened in the last uh, seven or eight months or so, right? Is a lot of litigation and a lot of changes uh, at the local level of how you can vote. So a lot of states for, uh, have what's called mail-in or absentee voting. There's no distinction between the two. It's all mail-in voting is absentee voting. Absentee voting is mail-in voting. Um, and what has happened is that states have, uh, many states have expanded opportunities for absentee voting, right? So in New York, you used to have to have it, an excuse to vote absentee now you don't. You don't need any particular excuse to why you want to vote absentee. Um, in other states, you see um, a, an expansion of you used to need some kind of excuse to vote absentee, but now COVID-19 is the excuse, right? So everyone has, basically, functionally, everyone has an excuse. But that's, even if that is sort of happening, right? So even if some states are, many states are expanding sort of opportunities to vote absentee, um, other states often have different rules about how you complete the absentee voting process. So in, uh, in a number of cases, LDF, along with our partners, have filed lawsuits challenging sort of restrictive absentee voting rules. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about my case in Alabama and then uh, maybe a little bit about my case in South Carolina, both of which have already made it to the Supreme Court, for better or worse. Um, in Alabama, they have a rule that says if you want to vote absentee, you need to have either two witnesses, so two people or a notary sign your absentee ballot. Um, and when you mail in your absentee ballot application, so just requesting an absentee ballot, you have to mail in a copy of your photo ID. Um, and what that, uh, you know, if you think about it for a few seconds, think about the people who are high risk, right? People who are elderly, people who have um, diabetes or other immune uh, disorders, who have heart disease, something like that. Those are people who the state of Alabama, who the CDC, who everyone agrees should stay home and not interact with as few of people as possible. But if you require them in order to vote to go out and find two witnesses to watch and sign your absentee, watch you sign, and then for them to sign your absentee ballot, it's requiring you to violate social distancing rules, right? Or if you think about people who 
maybe you have a copy of maybe you have your ID, but you don't have a computer or a photocopier at home, right? So that requires you again to leave home to interact with someone in order for you to cast your ballot. And even the photo ID laws are even more ridiculous because uh, we're talking about a photo ID requirement for absentee voting, right? So in that case, I'm photocopying an ID and I'm mailing it in to someone, but no one's actually taking my ID, looking at my face and doing a comparison, right? I could mail in a copy of any one of your pictures and no one would know that you were or were not Duell Ross, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so LDF challenged that law uh, in the context of the pandemic and we, uh, and we also challenged the fact that in Alabama for a long time, local counties had offered what's called curbside voting. So that available in most states, basically you drive up, if you're uh, elderly or have a disability, you don't have to get out of your car, poll worker comes to your car and you're able to vote. But Alabama Secretary of State had stepped in and basically stopped that uh, practice from happening despite it not violating any state law at all. Um, and so we sued and we won a uh, what's called a preliminary injunction for uh, the July 14th elections in Alabama. Uh, the state appealed to the Federal Court of Appeals uh, called the 11th Circuit. They lost there and then they appealed to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court in July voted five to four with the five more conservative justices voting against the four uh, more moderate justices um, leading to a, a basically a reversal of the win that we've gotten a little bit ago. Um, so those are sort of, and now, and we, we actually, despite that, went to trial uh, back in September and again won. And so the case is uh, again up on appeal. So those are sort of some of the examples to the extent you guys are hearing about litigation going on in right now and sort of the issues that folks are dealing with. Um, I see that there are some questions and comments that I'll try to, to address. Um, so it, it looks like people are asking about like what to do with regard to um, folks who will be poll monitors on election day or rather uh, poll watchers. So a little, a small bit of history for about the more than 30 years, the uh, Republican National Convention has been under consent order that had said that they could not do uh, sort of poll watching uh, without basically asking permission from a federal court first because uh, the Republicans had engaged in, um, had basically hired cops and things like that to watch the polls on election day, but really to intimidate African Americans and other voters of color. Uh, it's only this year that the Republican National Convention has come out from under that consent order um, because the court basically said, you know, enough time has passed that we don't think they're going to engage in this kind of conduct again. Uh, and that has sort of freed up um, uh, the, uh, the Republican Party in particular to do a lot more poll watching than they had previously done. And so I think that is in part why you're seeing a lot more calls from the president and others to do this kind of poll monitoring. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, um, I've done poll monitoring, nonpartisan poll monitoring, I've done partisan poll monitoring. It doesn't necessarily have to be that uh, poll monitoring is going to uh, end up being violent and awful. Democrats do poll monitoring, Republicans do poll monitoring. But I will acknowledge that obviously there is a, a very scary and heightened amount of rhetoric about like what people should do when they're poll monitoring, right? Poll monitoring is not standing outside with guns, threatening people who are allegedly engaged in voter fraud, although that is what some folks are saying they're going to do. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that LDF is doing is certainly is monitoring what's going on uh, for the election to make sure that if that does happen in any particular place, that uh, people are not going to be intimidated and that they, uh, folks are trying to intimidate them that there's not uh, you know, any kind of racial discrimination going on. The other thing that LDF is doing is that we have a, a phone number called 866-OUR-VOTE, uh, which is a, a I'll get, say that again, 866-OUR-VOTE. It's a, it goes to a uh, hotline that a number of civil rights organizations, including LDF, are monitoring on election day, but also for early voting periods and things like that. And so if you have an issue on election day, it's uh, something that, you know, LDF and others can deal with. 
And then the last thing I would say is like, depending on the state that you're in, in particular, you know, states are obviously taking this very seriously. I know in Michigan, um, I know in New York, uh, Michigan in particular, just because they've obviously, they've obviously had a recent threat to their uh, governor from, uh, from these sorts of folks. Um, but those are the things that we're trying to do at least proactively, right? One other thing I'll just say about in general about what you can do for election day that is uh, not related to poll monitoring, but is just related to like uh, what the polls are going to look like, right? So on election day, as you guys probably already voted this year in a primary or in local elections, um, a lot of the poll workers, as you guys know, are tend to be folks who are older, um, who are high at risk for COVID-19. And so one thing that LDF is encouraging younger folks to do is to uh, people who don't have high risk for COVID-19 is to volunteer to be a poll worker. You're right, they were domestic terrorists. I shouldn't have said uh, the people who were trying to kidnap the Michigan governor. Um, the the um, uh, One of the things that LDF is really encouraging younger folks in particular to do is to go out and volunteer to be poll workers. And the reason why that's important is obviously in the context of COVID-19, um, it's dangerous for older or high-risk people to be poll workers. And the, if we have a cadre of a lot of poll workers um, who are younger, then that means we don't have to have polling place closures. We don't have to have uh, a large number of people going to a small number of polling locations. So that's one of the things that we're encouraging folks to do. So if you have an interest um, and the time, please volunteer to be a poll worker. Um, and so I will not, um, you know, bore you guys too much with uh, with more of what I'm, uh, if I do want to stop and maybe see if we have some questions about uh, what I've been saying. So I'm incredibly grateful for you joining us today, Dual. I can't stress um, how much I'm indebted for you to come and speak. Um, and I know that you have a really, really tight schedule. I um, mean, you got to get back to the family, uh, do us also <laughs> God. Um, so I will, uh, I guess, give time for just one uh, quick question uh, before we um, wish uh, do out well. Um, so if you have a question you want to ask, um, you can just go ahead and raise your hand and one of us will select you to ask your question directly. I'll, I saw someone had a question and I'll just try to very briefly explain one. Someone asked how do voter ID laws disenfranchise uh, poor and, and uh, black communities. The reason why is because, you know, one thing people think about is like, oh, everyone has ID, right? So not everyone has ID, right? And uh, in Texas where we litigated there, something like 7% of black uh, registered voters and uh, a similar percentage of Latinx registered voters did not have acceptable photo ID versus only 2% of white voters had acceptable ID. And so that creates a real barrier for people. And then on top of that, in a place like Texas in particular, but in other places, you know, people who don't have ID don't have cars, don't have um, other resources that they would need in order to vote. And then in Alabama, as I said, uh, they have in order to vote absentee, you need to send in a copy of your photo ID, right? So even if you have photo ID, if you don't have access to a copier and you don't want to leave your house because there's a deadly raging pandemic going on to go make a copy at Kinko's or something, uh, those people who disproportionately don't have a car and don't have a, a driver's license and don't have a copier at home are African-American or other people of color who tend to be poor. And then the last thing I will say about that is that, um, you know, it, these, it's not just have a driver's license or have something with a photo ID on it. And a lot of places like Texas, it's have a very specific photo ID, right? So it's, you can use a gun license to vote in Texas, but you cannot use a student ID or even a federal ID in Texas to vote. And so it, um, you know, they picked the forms of ID that are acceptable based on who they thought, based on the fact that they thought white people would have a gun license, black people would have a student ID, so we're not gonna let a student or a federal ID be acceptable for voting. Um, so keep that in mind when folks are thinking about sort of the impact on voting rights. And sorry, someone had a question before I went into that explanation. 
Do well before you answer that a question. Yeah. I'm going to squeeze one question in too because I know you have to go. Um, the, the electoral college. Um, we we spoke a little bit about the. Uh, to, to be quite frank, the racist origins of the Electoral College. There was a debate going on uh, today about the Electoral College. Can you say a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, so I certainly think that the Electoral College is uh, anti-democratic and has origins in sort of um, the racism of the early, uh, earlier aspects of the design of the Constitution. And one of the things, I, you know, I didn't, I don't think LDF has a particular position on the Electoral College or not, but I know that me personally, I uh, am not in support of the Electoral College. I think it is it is deeply anti-democratic and one of the, and that's true regardless of who you want to vote for, right? If you are a Republican in California, your vote doesn't count. If you're a Democrat in Alabama, your vote functionally doesn't count, right? And so it really is um, just truly uh concerning and and deeply anti-democratic and you know some of the arguments that people give for why you want to keep the electoral college is you know no one would pay attention to iowa if there was no electoral college right but i care about everyone being able to vote in iowa but i also care about you know no one's paying attention to new york or california and that's uh where substantial numbers of americans live right um, and, and that's because you have this, this system that doesn't allow or really doesn't matter what the popular vote looks like. Um, and, and so, you know, personally, I think the, uh, the Electoral College is deeply problematic and anti-democratic, uh, but I'm happy to answer more questions about that or, or other issues for at least another uh, few minutes here. Now, um, um, unless there are um, any other burning questions, I am going to honor um, my commitment and allow you, um, allow you to go. And again, everyone, please join me in thanking Duwell, uh, Senior Counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund on the battlegrounds, in the courtroom, and on the streets fighting for our rights to vote and for education equality. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I hope you guys enjoyed. Thank you so much. Um, as I mentioned, we do have some of our uh, esteemed elected officials who are joining us today. And I just want to take the time to kind of give them an opportunity uh, to say a few words about the importance of voting and what is at stake in today's election. And so I have my co-workers uh, helping me out, texting me, letting me know um, which of our esteemed elected officials are on. And I can see that we have just been joined by Assemblywoman Carmen De La Rosa. I also see that we have, I'm just going to check my inbox. And uh, why don't we start with you? Welcome and thank you for joining us, Assemblywoman Carmen De La Rosa. I would ask you if you can just take a couple of minutes um, to say hello to our members and talk a little bit about the importance of voting and what's at stake in, this, in these upcoming elections. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join WE Act and the work that they have been doing to ensure that environmental justice is linked with racial justice and income justice, um, economic justice for our communities. Uh, obviously, the, these next elections will be the elections of our lifetime, in my opinion. Uh, it is important for us to, number one, make sure that our communities know the ways that they can vote. Uh, you can vote early, you can vote in person, you can vote by mail. Uh, what we're encouraging everyone to do is to go ahead and vote. Uh, this pandemic has really highlighted the inequities that have always existed in, in our communities in Northern Manhattan. Inequities that are linked to environmental justice factors, to poverty, to unemployment, to, to lack of access to mental health, health care, uh, and, and definitely the work that uh, we act is rooted in, which is environmental justice. And so it is important for us to ensure that we're bringing in uh, a, new, a new tenant 
at the White House who will ensure that uh, all of the things that are of need in our community are prioritized, um, especially things like the Green New Deal, um, infrastructure changes for our community that deal with uh, making an impact on environmental justice as well. So my plight to everyone is always vote, vote, vote. No one is perfect. No candidate is perfect. But at the end of the day, we know that we have a responsibility to ensure that those that do not represent our values are no longer in office. And so that is the call to action that we have for our communities. Make sure you vote. Remember that people died for your right to vote. Uh, people have shed blood for your right to vote. And there are still people in our community who do not have the privilege and luxury of actually going out and casting a vote, either because they are not citizens of this country or because they have no way of becoming citizens of this country. So we must make sure that we are always that voice for our communities that will fight for a government that is reflective of us. So I know you've heard it a million times before, but your voice is your vote. And we're encouraging you to use that voice um, to make sure that we uh, bring in, usher in a government that is reflective of our values. Thank you, Assemblywoman. And thank you for always standing side by side um, and being a true REACT member. Um, and it's a blessing to have you and it's a blessing to have you represent this community. It's my pleasure to always be here. I hope you all have a great meeting and continue the work that you're doing because it makes a difference in our community. Thank you. I'd like to pass it on now uh, to Assemblyman Danny O'Donnell. Forgive me if I pronounce your last name wrong, uh, but please say hello to our members uh, and tell them uh, why it's important to vote and what's at stake in these upcoming elections. There we go. Thank you so much. And it is an honor and pleasure uh, to follow my dear friend, Carmen De La Rosa. Um, I'd like to point out her start in politics was working for me. And so I'm very honored uh, to now have her as one of my colleagues. As she said, um, I, I'm proud of WEAC and what it does. I have been around for a long time now. And uh, WEAC has always been a leader um, on making sure that uh, our voice is heard as it relates to environmental issues, particularly environmental justice. And the only way we get to have that, those sort of things, is by having voices in the government. Um, to quote my friend Lynn manuel you got to be in the room where it happens. And having people in the room where it happens matters so that our interests are heard. And um, the only way to do that is to fill out the census, which I hope you all did, as well as vote. Um, I'm very fortunate. Um, I don't have an opponent, so I'm not even campaigning for me. I'm campaigning for the idea that voting is important and that straight down the ticket, you have to make sure that uh, your voice is heard. So I want to thank WEAC for setting this up. I want to thank Cecil, my friend, for inviting me. Um, I had a little technical difficulty earlier, so I finally fixed that, and here I am. And uh, you all have a great meeting and a great day, and thank you for your work. And by the way, I love the wall behind you. <laughs> thank you so much. It's a TikTok ins inspiration. Um, and likewise, thank you so much for always standing side by side, showing up and talking to our members um, and listening to the issues and, and really championing some of the work uh, that we are lifting up within the assembly. Um, so thank you, and we encourage you um, and, and everyone to um, follow both of our assembly members on the call and continue to make sure that you let them know the great job that they are doing um, and that we support them because we understand that this job is not easy, um, going in there every day and fighting for people like so we, we will be having uh, some additional elected officials, uh, speakers talking today. Uh, I'm going to introduce them as they trickle in. Uh, but nonetheless, I am going to move forward um, with our program. Do I have, I just want to make sure and see if I'm not missing any other elected official who may have uh, just joined. Uh, if there is, I'll ask my coworkers. 
Yes. Um, all right. So when we get uh, more of the officials joining us, I will introduce them as they come in. I'm going to move us on to a uh, quick Know Your Rights piece. We have an amazing attorney here with us. We have Haley Goenberg, who is the legal director of the New York Lawyers for Public Interest, where she guides the organization's litigation, advocacy, and advocacy. Before joining the New York Lawyers for Public Interest in 2018, Haley was the general counsel and dep deputy legal director of the National Civil Rights Organization, Linda Legal where she litigated landmark cases advancing the rights of LGBTQ people, including a range of path-breaking matters involving disability rights, health, access, discrimination against marginalized communities. Prior to that, she ran the citywide task force at the Legal Services for New York City, creating legal advocacy campaigns and training other lawyers and advocates to achieve high-impact to achieve high impact results for low income New Yorkers living with HIV. Haley was named the 2017 Outlaw Alumni of the Year by the New York University School of Law and received the 2018 Forger Award from the American Bar Association for Sustained Excellence, advocating for the rights of people living with HIV. She has served as the Wassenstein Public Interest Fellow at Harvard and sat on the Princeton University Gender and, Sex and Sexuality Studies Advisory Council and the New York State Council on Women and Girls. Haley earned an undergraduate degree from Princeton University, a law degree from New York uh, University School of Law, and a certificate in change leadership from Cornell University. And without further ado, I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Haley. Thank you, Marquise. It is great to be welcome, here. Welcome. Welcome. Great to be here. Um, I am legal director, like you said, of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. We are a 44-year-old community-driven civil rights organization. We are lawyers, we are social workers, we are community organizers, and we are working shoulder to shoulder with clients and community groups to amplify power. Now, we flex and respond to community need. Right now, a huge piece of that is actually making sure we have a democracy where each of us gets a vote and a say in how this place runs. And I know that that is woven into We Act's mission, which says this organization prioritizes informed and engaged residents who participate fully in decision-making on key issues that impact their health and community. So we've worked in coalition with We Act for years. We have represented We Act as your lawyers, and I'm personally a member of WE ACT because I believe in the mission and the impact of WE ACT as a strong environmental justice group. So when Cecil or Charles or Marquise or any of you calls me, I show up. I'd like to present some information on voting rights, fighting intimidation and suppression. I can answer questions now, or if we don't have time or I need to get more information, let me know. And we'll be back in touch with you next week because this is ongoing. This is not over till it is over. Um, some basic rights information. Uh, and I'll just go through, you know, a whole list and, um, and there's more again, if people have questions. Uh, New York voters have a right to take up to two hours of paid time off to vote if your work schedule otherwise would get in the way of voting in person. You have to request with your employer, but nobody should be kept from voting. And if the work schedule is an issue, you have the legal right to request two hours to go and get that time to vote. Um, you vote free from harassment and intimidation. We're gonna have a whole section on that. Uh, you vote without ID, unless you're a first time voter registered by mail, didn't provide identification. If you're a first time voter and you registered by mail and you provided your ID, you should be good. If there's any problem with registration, if there's any problem at a voting place, with seeing that you're in the roles or some question about your right or whether you're in the right place. As New Yorkers, we have the right to vote by affidavit or a provisional ballot. And it's a paper ballot gets put in an envelope and that'll get verified and counted. So if you're there to vote and someone um, working the polls has confusion or has a question, that doesn't mean you walk away and leave. You get a provisional ballot, you record that vote. 
So uh, voting by mail, a big deal, especially now, right? With COVID-19, we have additional reasons, any of us, to vote by mail, to vote absentee in the general election. Uh, when we um, get our ballot by mail, we should s fill it out and send it back immediately. We know that the mail has been slowed down. For one thing, record numbers of us are probably voting by mail, um, but also we know that the US mail has been slowed down. So get that ballot, turn it around, send it back in the mail. Also, and I think not so much where we act um, has its uh, membership and mission base, but in the city, in Brooklyn, for instance, there have been some ballots that were sent out with the wrong name. So that seems to have been caught and those ballots are being replaced, but check your name, make sure it's right, make sure if you're voting by mail, you sign and date the envelope. That's one of the most common reasons that votes get challenged by mail is if they're not signed and dated. So don't let that happen. Let's not let that happen. Um, the deadline to apply for an absentee ballot by mail, and you can apply online if you want, is October 27th. Let's beat that deadline if we want to vote by mail, but that's um, the deadline to apply by mail, online, email, or fax. You can apply for an absentee ballot in person up to November 2nd, the day before the deadline, uh, the day before the election. But again, like, let's not push it. Um, things are complicated enough right now, um, but you have the right to go up till then. On this Dickens. Mm. Um, early voting. This could be a good idea. We can participate in early voting. The early voting site might be different from your regular polling site. You can check on the New York City Board of Elections site or 866-VOTE-NYC and find, located by county, you can find your early voting site. And there are sites that are open as soon as Saturday, October 24th through Sunday, November 1st. And that information, you know, check, check online or call to verify where it is, but you can do that. Um, and it, it might avoid, avoid some complications on uh, election day itself. If you're voting in person, find, confirm your polling location ahead of time. Again, you can do that online or by calling the Board of Elections. Um, and on polling day itself, in-person polling sites are open from six in the morning till 9 p.m. Um, if you are in line when the polling site closes, if you're in the site, they're required to allow you to vote. So don't leave, insist on voting and report if you're denied. And at the end, I have a slide on places to report. If you we're voting in line, let's be as safe as we can. Mask up, my favorite homemade mask. Mask up, New York City, center of a global pandemic. We Act and NILPI represent some of the hardest hit neighborhoods. Working with we, we Act to improve how the city handles COVID is something that NILPI is doing. Protect yourself, your families, your friends, your neighbors. Uh, let's see. Um, if when you get there to vote in person, if that's how you're voting, if your name doesn't appear on the polling list, again, that doesn't mean that you can't vote. Ask for an affidavit or a paper ballot. If you're challenged in any way, get that paper ballot. Um, we'll, we'll clean up later, but don't leave. Um, insist on that. Uh, let's see. And then afterwards, the Board of Election can check the records and verify that you were indeed able to vote. There are some special circumstances. What if you moved or changed address? A lot of people are mobile, especially right now. Best to notify the Board of Elections and submit an updated registration form, or you can also do that on my DMV, the motor vehicle site. Um, but if you didn't, you can still vote on election day at your new polling place for your new address. You'll have to vote by that paper affidavit ballot. If you move to another state from New York near the registration deadline, you can still vote for president and you can get a special presidential ballot from the County Board of Elections where you're registered to vote in New York. 
So you can still weigh in and have your voice heard on the presidential election. People with disabilities, one of the oldest practices that we have at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest is disability justice. And we really work hard and sometimes litigate very hard on the rights of people with disabilities to vote. Um, you can vote at your local polling place with the assistance of a person of your choice. And if you don't have a specific person, you can be assisted by two ins election inspectors from different parties. And all the polling places in New York are supposed to be accessible unless they're granted an exception from accessibility, um, in which case one can vote absentee. Um, and people experiencing homelessness can vote. Uh, and there's some registration information. We're past the registration uh, deadline now, but people experiencing homelessness who are already registered have the right to vote. People who have a felony conviction or currently on parole, if they've finished a felony sentence, your rights are reinstated, eligible to register and vote. On parole, some people can vote on parole, some can't, and you can check your status online at vote.nyc. And um, even if you can't vote right now, you regain your right to vote at the end of parole. Uh, language and literary, list literacy assistance. There are certain polling sites that are required to provide information and ballots in a range of languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Korean, Bengali. Uh, and voters can be assisted if, um, for literacy challenges or language challenges by an inspector from each political party or a person of their choosing. The exception there is union representatives or employers can't do that. Survivors of domestic violence, intimate partner violence, um, can contact the Board of Ed, uh, Board of Elections, pardon me, to request an accommodation to get a special ballot and avoid the regular polling place, and can have the voter registration record kept private. Young people in our lives should get ready to vote. So hopefully they're registered already. Um, for future elections, also be aware, for the young people in our lives, voice is very important. Uh, we have a new law, 16 year olds, 16 and 17 year olds can fill out voter registration applications online or in person at Board of um, Elections or DMV, get automatically registered to vote when they turn 18. So, you know, voices of the future. Vote, make sure everyone you know votes. Voter intimidation. So Duell and our elected officials covered some of the history of voter suppression and intimidation. Uh, someone intimidating voters can be charged with a felony, can be fined. It's using threats, coercion, or other attempts to intimidate to try to interfere with somebody's right to vote. Could include physically blocking polling places, threatening language, yelling at people, disrupting, interrogating voters, looking over your people's shoulders while voting, questioning voters about choices, um, false misleading signs, false information generally. Uh, if you experience voter intimidation or harassment or see it at the voting place, uh, you can call for immediate help. You can notify a poll worker of the intimidation tactor, tactic, um, report it to the elections commissioner, call it into the voter protection hotlines, and uh, Duell gave a number and I'll have a slide at the end. Uh, you can call the US Department of Justice. There are some questions right now about what's going on at the US Department of Justice, but they do have a voting right hotlines and I think we should at least make them make a record of something that's happening. Poll watchers can, well, you know, legally protected right to have poll watchers, but there have been reports of poll watchers being used as an instrument of voter intimidation. Uh, Unofficial or unappointed poll watchers aren't per permitted to go inside polling places and poll watchers have to be registered voters in the state county district that they're monitoring. And New York provides just three poll watchers per district at any one time for any candidate. And only one can be within what they call the guardrail, which isn't really a physical space, but I mean, there's not usually a physical rail, but it refers to the portion of your polling site that has the table that the election inspectors are, inspectors are using and the board of election equipment and your privacy booth and the ballot marking area and scanners and these uh, partisan poll watchers 
only one allowed within the space and not allowed to be within this sort of guardrail protected area. If one of these poll watchers challenges your vote, they're not supposed to do it directly in confrontation with you. They're supposed to go to an election inspector, you know, someone on duty officially within the poll site, and that official will decide on the challenge. And I think if challenges are happening, that that needs to be reported as well. Would very much support and encourage that. Voter suppression, last topic I'll cover. Suppression tactics to block people, discourage people, uh, uh, press them to just stay home and not participate, raise our voices. These suppression tactics are particularly focused on people of color, especially focused on people of color, extra specially focusing on black people in America. And we have documentation and investigations on all level that are showing this. If you have a question about the power of the vote of people of color, the power of the vote of the black community, you can ask the NAACP talk to do well, or we could ask the Russian government, which we have documentation and investigations for the past several years and up to this year showing interference in US elections, singling out African-Americans. The Senate Intelligence Committee has just issued yet another report on this. Using Facebook pages, Instagram, Twitter posts, Russian information operatives are, quote, <laughs> using an overwhelming operational emphasis on race and no single group of Americans is targeted more than African-Americans. Two thirds of the content they're generating contains a term related to race, and it's principally aimed at African-Americans in key metropolitan areas, using pages like Blacktivist, getting millions of engagements with people online, and it was bad in 2016, and it is worse since then. Uh, so we've got challenges internally in the US, Got a lot of challenges externally, internationally, trying to influence the US and particularly targeting, you know, core WE Act membership, really. Um, flooding social media with false reports, conspiracy theories, trolls. Uh, and, you know, when I look at Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, I am reminded that um, Nilpi, because a big piece of what we do is immigrant justice, so many of our immigrant clients use WhatsApp. So that targeting, that's on purpose. That is on purpose. And it's a racial justice issue. Uh, the Kremlin, according to um, the latest report coming from federal in investigators, now is outsourcing disinformation to troll farms in Ghana and Nigeria, hoping that African nationals will be more convincing speaking to American audiences about racial division in the US. So actually recruiting from Africa to target black Americans. All right, some uh, typical, I mean, someone should you know, write the novel, but it's not fiction. Typical rumors or misinformation. Let's cover some things with concern that we have some of it circulating now and that on election day, it could really amp up and that we will need to see through it and debunk it and keep our votes counted. Um, false information circulates on social media. Uh, some of that false information, the suggestion that voters can cast ballots by text message, email, or on the internet. This is a way of diverting votes. Don't go to your vo voting place, it will say. You can just text in your vote. You can't. No one can text in their vote. In very limited circumstances, people who are serving in the military overseas can use some internet options. Uh, except for that, in very specific circumstances, you don't vote by text message, email, or internet. Voting machine malfunction rumors. Reports that crop up saying, oh, all, all the machines at your voting place are broken. Uh, th they've all been hacked. Uh, don't vote. You know, it, it won't be valid. This is very common on election day, and you might even get videos of malfunctioning voting machines and they're going viral, they're on social media. Unless you have rock solid evidence that the claim is true, it's generally like be highly skeptical and vote. Um, 
Some of what I just mentioned is tied to misleading photos and videos, um, all kinds of doctored and mislabeled um, photos that are created and circulating, um, saying that uh, there's going to be police activity or ICE activity or, um, you know, if, you, if people show up, they'll be arrested at the polls. Uh, some of that is particularly aimed at Latino voters. If you see something that looks like misinformation, if you see anything that's discouraging you from voting, um, there's a really good chance that it's misinformation. When possible, rely on an official government website for voting related information. Look for .gov at the end of a website address. Before sharing a viral story on election day that looks suspicious um, and like it might be a piece of voter suppression discouraging people from showing up, check a fact checking website, snopesfactcheck.org, see if it's been debunked. There are also websites that will let you search a photo image to see if it's or help see if it's old or mislabeled or it's been manipulated. And if you find misinformation online, you can take it directly to the social media platforms, launch a report with them, the AG's office in New York, or um, send it to the media, you know, legit media of your choice. I know the New York Times is looking for um, this kind of information to write stories um, and other outlets too. Uh, finally, this is not over till it's over, especially with all the absentee ballots and the counting that's going to happen and um, how contested this election is. Um, it's not over till it's over and that may not be November 3rd voting day. So um, NILPI has produced videos on protester health and safety. If people end up taking to the streets to show a sustained presence for the rule of law and the right to vote, and we have information on um, protester health and safety. It's on our website and it is being recirculated. We're putting out sort of packages of that information from now um, till the election is decided. Uh, we also have information on racism, police brutality as a public health threat, can connect to some protest activity. We are here, we are with We Act for the duration as long as this takes. And let me see if I can manage a screen share of places where you can report and get help if there is a problem. Let's see if I can manage myself technologically here. Okay. All right. Marquise, have I succeeded? Am I showing the key contacts for voting information? Yay, thumbs up. Okay. Um, and I can give this to you if, if there's uh, email follow-up or something like that so that everybody has this sheet. These are just some key contacts for voting information or problems. Poll workers right then, consider reporting to the media, New York City Board of Elections, Attorney General. Uh, very um, proud to know my neighbor Tish James, first woman and first black person in the AG's role in New York. She takes this and her whole office takes this seriously. The AG has an election hotline. Uh, you can report discrimination, barriers. You can do it by phone, by email, um, by web form. And uh, Duell mentioned the election protection hotline, nonpartisan. You can call in these problems. They also have it in Spanish. US Department of Justice voting rights hotline. Again, let's at least make the record with these folks. And there's a phone number for New York lawyers for the public's, public interest, where I am. Uh, okay, and then uh, with respect for um, all of our voting rights, the Black vote and how it's been targeted and the strength of Black communities in making sure that we succeed. Oh, I'll put it, I see in the chat. Yeah, I'll put it in. Um, respect for um, Black votes, making sure that we succeed, and the fact that the Black vote is extremely powerful in this election. Uh, Marquise and I were taking a look at a little uh, inspirational media. And so, Marquise, may I just, may I run the couple minutes? Okay. So let me attempt the screen share again and hope for some video inspiration. Where am I going? Where am I going? 
Well, I was there, getting her back. It was queued up and I lost it. Here's a woman with eyebrows. Oh, forget it. Here's one Just a eyebrows. second, let me get rid of this. Believe in her. All right. Actually, can we I come back to it? Yeah, I'm gonna, we're gonna come back. In fact, I think it might be good to close with it. Excellent um, idea, and I will fix my tech problem. She, she was there and she clicked off because I was, because uh, we've been here <laughs> chatting a bit. Yes, do that. Thanks. Yeah. So thank you so much, Haley, for joining us. I ask everyone to please join me in giving a round of applause. I hope that you receive some uh, good information to empower you to make sure that your vote is actually counted. Um, Haley is going to share that information in the chat box, but I also will be sending you all a follow-up email with all of that information to make sure you have it before November 3rd. Again, I am just so honored to be standing side by side with you and working in partnership with WEAC uh, to make real change. And, and thank you for being a strong supporter. And more importantly, thank you for being a WEAC member. And so now I'm gonna kick it off um, and we're gonna hear from uh, some more of our elected officials. Um, I wanna take the time to introduce our assemblywoman, Inez Dickens. Uh, Inez, uh, Assemblywoman Inez Dickens, could you please say hello to our members? Uh, tell them why it's important. Let us know what crucial work you are working on and what's at stake in the upcoming elections. Well, good morning, good morning uh, to all the WEAC members and friends. And Haley, thank you so much for such a comprehensive um, uh, overview of what the possibilities are, what has happened, what could happen. I just want to add to that um, because that was so, you know, fulfilling and so informational. I want to add to that uh, five sites, specific sites for Northern Manhattan uh, for early voting from October the Sunday, October 24th to um, the November 1st. That's the forum at 601 West 125th at Broadway, the new building of Columbia. That's one site. Uh, PS 175 at 175 West 134th Street between Adam Clayton Powell and, and uh, Malcolm X Boulevard. At Wadley High School on 114th Street between Frederick Douglass and Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard. At 104th Street um, on the lower part of the uh, um, of, we ha of West Harlem, um, at the Harlem School, that's what it's called. That's that's going to be a site. Um, uh, we only had one site last year. Um, I was able to fight along with my colleagues to get um, five sites here in the Harlem area. And when I say Harlem. West Harlem, Central Harlem, East Harlem uh, area. And the other thing I want to add to that is that if you had uh, written in, uh, went online, called in and received your ballot, and because of the fear of mailing in the ballot, and because of the fiasco that happened in Brooklyn just last week, th that each of those polling sites, as well as there's others downtown. I don't want it to make it like that's the only ones. I'm talking about the ones that, you know, uptown. There's going to be additional sites downtown and additional sites in Washington Heights. Uh, they're going to be uh, locked boxes that the Board of Elections will pick up every evening. And you can deposit, instead of mailing it, you can, now remember, you must sign your ballot, sign your envelope. It requires two signatures. If you don't sign in two places, it invalidates the ballot. So if you sign the ballot and sign the envelope that you put the ballot in, and then there's another envelope 
that you put the, back, the sealed envelope in. It's supposed to have two stamps, but it may not. So it means you have to put two stamps on it. But if you choose not to mail it, there's going to be at each of the early voting sites and on the day of election on November the 3rd at your regular polling site where you would ordinarily go to, there's going to be lock boxes that you can deposit your ballot to if you decide that you're fearful about putting it in the mail. So I just wanted everyone to know that the early voting sites are not necessarily the sites you go to on November the 3rd, but they will be at the sites, but on election day where you ordinarily go and uh, the board of elections is now mailing out. And I hope most people got it. They're mailing out uh, your uh, election district, your assembly district, your uh, senatorial district and your congressional district and your polling site. So I hope that everyone um, uh, got that. But if you didn't, as Haley said, you could call into the Board of Elections or you can go online on your, um, on your smartphone or uh, uh, on a computer and you can look up your address and find out where your polling site is based upon your address. Um, and it is true that now um, 16 and 17 year olds can register, but they still cannot vote until they're 18. And I wanna add that yes, due to the next gens of the NAACP, they have been registering uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of young people uh, and encouraging them not to just register, but to register and come out and vote because in it, black people, we died for this right. We, our ancestors were murdered. They were hung from trees for the right to vote. They fought for the right to vote. And, and we should not let their deaths be in vain because we don't like who's running or because we don't think our vote counts. Every single vote counts. And so we've got to remember our history, just like other ethnicities remember their histories. The black person must begin to recognize and remember our history and what we contributed to this country and to this, this whole entire world and that we died in this country. We were murdered when we tried to, to, to step up and vote. And the other thing I want people to remember is New York wasn't so liberal because I remember as a child in, in New York, you had to take a test. You had to take a test to register to vote. And if you failed that test, because who the heck knew what, what uh, the uh, 12th Amendment was? They gave a test right here in New York for you to register to vote. And if you didn't pass it, you couldn't register. So it wasn't just in Southern states. This was right here in New York, and I remember that. So, you know, I can't stress it enough, the importance, because every single vote, I, I know somebody that won last year an election um, for district leader by two votes, by two votes. Mm -hmm. So that means every single vote counts. And the last thing I want to mention is that in polling sites, which are usually at our schools, where there's a lot of election districts, like I had one at a school that had like eight election districts, and um, the opposing party, I'll call it, um, thought that that was a huge voting site. So they sent even their, uh, their, uh, the, their chair of their party their state party, along with about eight lawyers and uh, the state police to that site to do voter suppression. And they stood outside, they came inside, and I uh, had to call for help because I was there with my inspectors and my poll site workers, but I was there al alone trying to push back. And, and I had to call for help. Uh, uh, to, to, and Bella Abzug sent her daughter up to me 
as well as others. And that, 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 that woman was amazing. And she was an attorney and she was able to battle back with, with me. I was street battling and, said, and she had the law that she could battle back on. And the other thing is when we're talking about poll watchers, they must have a poll watcher certificate. Poll watcher certificate. They can't just walk in and tell you they're a poll watcher. They must have a poll watcher certificate that they must produce. And as Haley said, they must not, if they uh, uh, want to contest someone voting, they're not supposed to confront the, uh, the, the voter. They're supposed to speak to the coordinator in that site. And the, they can speak, of course, to the police officer in that site. And if they say anything to the actual, uh, 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 the poll worker, the poll worker will take it to immediately to the uh, coordinator of that site. So I just wanted to add those extra little things and, and, and those actual uh, addresses so that we'd be aware of, of what's going on. And to know that you, if you choose not to mail it in, even if you got the ballot, even if you got the ballot, you can drop it in a lock box that's going to be at each one of the early voting sites. Or if you, even if you mail it in and you become fearful, you can go and vote. And it's up to the Board of Elections to figure that out. Right. Thank, thank so you. Thank so you. Much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Before thank you go, I do have a question. I'm curious, what do you think is the most important thing on the ballot uh, come November? Oh, when you say mo you're talking about as far as the the, the issues, the, issues. The, the most important thing right now today. Well, there's, there's I don't know if I can even say any one thing, and that's because we've got a, an attack on immigration. We've got an attack on on blacks in this country. People of color, period, are being attacked in this country, and it was always there. I'm gonna say this, it was always there, but it, it, it laid down like, like a lion laid down. And if I may, and I'm sorry, this administration has made it say that it's okay for it to raise its ugly head and come out and attack. It's made it okay. Almost made it like it's illegal to do so. And, and not only to police authorities, but to individuals in this country feel it's okay now to raise up and show what I really think. Now, if we can talk about, we know education is important, health is important, environment is important. I mean, I could roll off a lot of that, but if we don't protect our inalienable right to exist in this country without being murdered, without being, uh, attacked without a wall being built, without being told we live, we come from shithole countries. If we don't stop that, then there's going to be no need to talk about education and environment because all that's going to be gone anyway. So we got to, we got to, we got work at the base. We got work at the human rights base that we got to work hard to protect. And damn it, we got to come out and vote like our lives depend upon it because it does. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman. I don't know about everyone else, but I am certainly fired up by hearing you speak. Um, and like all of our other elected officials, I just want to thank you for standing side by side, we act and champion some of our work up in the assembly. We need you and we appreciate you and thank you so much. No, I think we act because we act has an, an agenda that as to why it was created. And, and now you've also taken on that it, it, a bigger agenda because now you've told everyone you're going to come out and you're going to vote. That's right. That is right. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to also introduce our Senator Jose Serrano. Thank you so much for joining us today, Senator. Please. Uh, say hello to our members. Uh, tell them why it's important. What are you working on? And what's at stake in this upcoming election? 
Well, thank you very much to you and to all the membership of WEAC for having me. And I have to tell you, listening to the inspiring words of, of my colleague, Inez Dickens, uh, I, I don't think I can say it any more eloquently than she has. And talking about the importance of voter participation, voter efficacy, uh, grassroots organizing. Uh, she has a very long history herself and uh, within her family um, of fighting for these things. And I think she uh, has just given us a masterclass in uh, the real need for voter participation now more than ever. Um, as was mentioned, I, uh, I'm a state senator. I represent the 29th uh, Senate District, which covers parts of Manhattan and the Bronx. Uh, within the Senate, I'm the chair of the majority conference. I'm also chair of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, uh, Parks, and Tourism. Uh, so uh, these are issues that I feel very strongly about. And uh, when we consider how grassroots participation, voter efficacy plays into all of the different issues that we care deeply about, it's very easy to draw a line uh, to see how those who are pushing for voter suppression to further disenfranchise communities of color are also at odds with a lot of the things that we're trying to fight for, such as such uh, the membership of WE Act in environmental justice. When you consider that uh, we in, in our communities, in Latino and African com American communities, have suffered disproportionately high rates of uh, disease caused by uh, environmental injustice. When you look at the overwhelming negative impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on our communities directly linked to these health disparities, uh, it becomes clearer and clearer that environmental justice is indeed social justice in every sense of the term. So when you look at what the, what's at stake in this election, and I, I was very glad to hear from, from uh, the Assemblywoman and, and others on that issue, uh, it's really that and so many other things. One of the things that we try to, we've tried to do legislatively uh, in Albany is to remove barriers to voting. Since uh, the assembly has been working very hard on this for many, many years, but the, the recent uh, Senate Democratic majority over the last two years, uh, we've, uh, we've voted on and passed a number of bills to remove these barriers to voting, uh, to allow folks to vote early, to vote by mail, no excuse, absentee ballot, uh, ballots. Um, we're also, uh, we've also voted on same day voter registration that needs to be finalized through a constitutional amendment, which requires it being on the ballot, ironically, for all voters in 2021. But hopefully, same-day voter registration will become the law in New York State. Um, so removing these barriers to voting, I think, is one of the most uh, important ways that we, uh, that we stand up for our community, uh, that we stand up for the things that we care about, um, such as environmental justice, such as the arts and culture as a transformative vehicle for our communities, uh, housing justice, education justice, um, and, and making sure that the barriers that are in that, you know, un unfortunately, and I think the, the Assemblywoman alluded to this, but I, uh, I wanted to mention as well, as a youngster growing up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, I, I would see what I thought was progression on issues involving human rights and civil rights. And one might think that, wow, we've, we've come a long way. And then you realize under these past four years how easy it is to sponge away so many of the accomplishments that we thought were set in stone. They weren't, unfortunately. So the battle never ends for social justice, for human rights, for civil rights. We find ourselves at a, at a time and a place where we're fighting for things, for common basic humanities that we thought we'd never have to fight again for. Voter disenfranchisement is probably one of the, one of the most potent ways uh, that uh, those who have been against communities of color, the tools that they've used to keep us out of the system, uh, to keep us from, from sort of handling our destiny within our communities of color. Uh, the Voting Rights Act many years ago sought to empower communities of color 
so that we can have voter represent, we can have elected representation that was indicative and reflective of our communities. But any effort to disenfranchise voters um, and also to, to make it difficult for people to participate in the census, the chilling effect that these last four years have had on immigrant communities and on their ability or want to participate in the census and other, and other things that are participatory, I think has created an erosion within our community. So I think one of the best ways that we can stand up to that and to fight against that is to uh, really take advantage of the different vehicles that we have for early voting, uh, to vote by ballot because the pandemic has you know, has had a, a real significant effect on communities of color more than others. I was reading this morning, uh, by the way, that uh, while the pandemic doesn't affect youngsters as much as adults, that nearly all of the children who have died of COVID have been children of color. So I think it is important to understand how we've been negatively impacted, how the, the racial and, and, uh, uh, and ethnic health disparities have affected our communities. Uh, and it makes it so important to use the, the vehicle of, of absentee voting as a way to keep ourselves safe, using the drop boxes, as the assembly member mentioned, as ways to ensure that our votes get to the right place. Thank you, Senator. Um, I want to ask you as well, um, is there any work you want to lift and, and share with our members that you think is crucial um, for our members to know and perhaps maybe get involved? Well, I, I think it's, you know, at this point in time, as we sit here, uh, you know, very close to uh, Election Day, I think a lot of the efforts had been uh, on voter registration, trying to get new folks, younger communities, to feel that they could make a difference. Um, and I'm so happy to see all of the elected officials, all of my colleagues in government, and so many of the nonprofit organizations, again, completely nonpartisan, not, not pushing for one vote over another, but just creating a situation where young people feel that they can have an impact on, on this government. Um, and getting, uh, sort of breaking down that barrier where uh, younger people, and I remember when I was a, a, a teenager, which was just yesterday, right? But anyway, um, where we would sit around wondering, well, what difference does it make? What, what can we really do? How can we change all of the negative things that we're seeing on television and on the news? Well, it just takes one vote. Uh, as the assembly member mentioned, elections can be de decided by one or two votes. Um, and that could change the trajectory of the policies and issues that are dealt with in our own communities, and uh, especially on the local level. And so you, you know, obviously the focus is on national elections at this time, but all levels of, of participatory voting are so important on, on, for so many different reasons. That's right. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a Saturday. I know you are busy, <laughs> but we organizers have a phrase. The revolution happens at night, and on weekends. And so I thank you for making that sacrifice to join us today to have this important discussion. And we look forward to seeing you on the battlefield. Thank you, my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. I just wanna ask um, Haley to uh, come back up. We had a couple of questions in the chat box um, regarding the ballots and making sure those mail-in ballots uh, counted. I know that you've been responding in the chat box, uh, but I want to give an opportunity to sort of bring that conversation uh, to the mic. So if, if you can just say a couple of words, Haley, um, on that topic. Sure. Uh, tell me, is my, is my, am I showing at the moment? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so here, here is a long ballot. All right, this is, if you're voting absentee, whether you're mailing it or you're dropping it off for early, this is what it looks like. Two sides, you have the opportunity to vote two sides. We very much support voting two sides. Um, big long thing, you don't sign it. However, here's the, um, the envelope, the security envelope. When you fold this up, it's got a barcode. Well, you put it in here. I'll show you. 
the, the, secure, the envelope has a barcode. It should have your name and the barcode. And then when you seal it on the back, they've added a red X for your signature on the security envelope and then a little space for the date. So you sign on the red X as you're registered, match your registration name, and then you date it. Then you take that and put it inside. If you're mailing it, you put it inside this mailing envelope. So here you see a space, it says place stamp. So you need one stamp and that's where you put it. And then the clear panel here, when you fold, um, when, you, when you take the security envelope, you take the, uh, the barcode part and you make it show through the window. So those are the, the physical functions, the long ballot, the security envelope, and then if you're mailing it, your mailing envelope with a stamp. And how, how do residents know if they're mailing a ballot that their ballot has been received and counted? I want to know that. If you're, if you're military overseas, there is an online option. Um, I am, I, I don't have information on whether there's, and maybe someone in the group does, that's something that I would pledge to get um, back to you on um, if someone here doesn't have the answer, but I know of military and overseas, those limited circumstances where you can actually check online and see that it is counted. Does anyone have more information? I will pledge to get back um, with any further verification information, but I, I don't have that right now. Uh, Haley, this, Haley, this is Christopher here at React. She's, uh, Haley is correct, everyone. Um, there, is, there is a way to check if, if, they've re if, you, if your ballot is coming to you. There's a way to check it in that respect, but there's not a way to check, at least at this point in New York State. I know some of you are calling from other parts of the country. There's not a way for us to check if your ballot has been counted. Um, I, 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 I don't believe there's a way to do that, and there's no mechanism at this point. Um, I know there are in other states, but there's, that is not the case here in New York. <clears throat> okay, can you just introduce yourself so everyone know uh, who this cool person is? Are, me? Are you speaking to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, I'm, I'm, I'm about to have a presentation, everyone. Um, I'm Christopher Casey. I'm the new director of voter engagement here at WEAC. I've been here all of six weeks. And I just have to say, coming to meetings, coming to our membership meetings, I've come to two. Um, it feels a little bit of like going to church and to a seminar, which I've never felt in my life. And it's super, super cool. Um, I have a long history in organizing. I began my organizing career with uh, Barack Obama in 2008, uh, moved on to moveon.org. Sorry for all the emails. <laughs> um, and then from there to Consumer Reports. Uh, so, some of you may know that that magazine that gives you ratings on toasters and cars and <laughs> you know solar panels um, also does advocacy. And so I did some advocacy work at Consumer Reports for five years. Right. And most recently came from Penn America, the, the organization that awards the Penn Prizes, which does free expression advocacy in the world. Thank you, Christopher. And we are going to be hearing from you very soon about our 2021, 2020 and 2021 voter registration or voter engagement campaign. Um, I was going to break up some of this speaking, but I saw that we are joined uh, by our Senator Robert Jackson. Um, I just want to pause and, and give the Senator an opportunity to say hello to the WEAC members. Uh, Senator Jackson, Say hello. Uh, let us know what you are working on, why it's important to vote, and what's at stake in these upcoming elections. Well, good afternoon, a WEAC family. I just came back from running the first annual Dykeman 5K run. And so I was trying to get online on my computer, but I was not getting on fast enough, so I joined on my phone. So I hope that you can see me. I hope you can hear me. First, let me thank you for inviting me to be a part of the meeting. And with respect to voting, uh, as you know, we all know, but I don't assume that everyone knows, but last night was the last day uh, and evening to register to vote in New York City, New York State. In New York City, you could have taken your ballot down there, not ballot, your, your registration card down to the Regional Board of Elections, which is at 200 Varick Street, by nine o'clock. And if you did that at two minutes to nine, then you would be registered to vote for the November 3rd election and every election thereafter 
depending on what party you belong to. I mean, obviously, if you uh, don't put a party, uh, as you know, you cannot vote in any primary because you don't have a party affiliation. So uh, some people, one person said, listen, I, I voted in June and they returned my ballot, said I wasn't registered. I said, okay, let's go online uh, to the State Board of Elections. Let's pull you up and we do that on the phone. And there it is, no party affiliation. I said, that's why they rejected your ballot because you were not affiliated with the Democratic Party. So in essence, we, those that are involved in the process as elected public officials and advocates, must educate, educate, I jokingly say educate. We have to educate our people about the processes that they have to do. For example, like the example I just gave you. But I was out yesterday morning from about 7.30 to 9.30 on Dykeman Street and Broadway, Dykeman Street and Nagel Avenue at the number one train, registering people to vote, giving them forms, and so Chris Nichols, my deputy chief of staff, joined me and we did a couple of census. We handed out a voter registration forms. We gave some people some masks. Uh, then Chris and I walked across the street to Nagel Avenue, uh, right there at the beginning of the Dykeman houses. And we had a COVID-19 test. So, uh, because since we're out all the time, it's imperative that we make sure that we're healthy and safe and not spreading COVID-19 to other people. You know what I mean? But from electoral process point of view, uh, to register to vote and voting uh, brings about political power uh, within your government, both your city, your state. Um, and that's extremely, extremely important. It, it will determine who are going to be representing us. Like uh, in our country right now, we have Donald Trump who is our president. And I know that everyone, everyone has an opinion, either good, bad, or indifferent, uh, but he's our president. Uh, so uh, you may say, well, I didn't vote for him, or I voted for him. But the bottom line is there's a process. And uh, besides the general election count, as far as how many people vote, there is the electoral, electoral college. And that is the deciding factor on who is the president. Because in the previous election, you know, they say after the fact that Hillary Clinton had three million more votes than Donald Trump, but Donald Trump had more electoral college votes. And so understanding the process that we're involved with is very, very important in the process. So that's one thing. And so number two, um, as you know, uh, de Blasio is our mayor. Uh, he is term limited. About 37 members of the New York City Council are term limited. Um, the controller is, is term limited. And the only person at the top of the city government that's not term limited, but has to run for reelection is Jamani Williams. So term limits, as you don't know, if you don't know, came about uh, uh, around 2001 or 2000. And in 2001, everyone basically was turned over in the city council. And that's how I was elected as a member of the city council. So you, meaning the voters, have an opportunity to make a huge difference uh, this coming election in November, depending on who you vote for for presidency and for state senate, state assembly, and there's judges all on the ballot. And if you don't know, you get to you need to ask and, and inquire among your elected public officials or your family members who's who and what's what. And thus you will decide who is elected at the local and at the state and at the federal level. That's one thing. Number two, uh, from a political point of view, I, I, I deem them the same thing. One is voting. Another thing is registering uh, in the census because that brings about uh, economic power, meaning based on all of us filing our census, the more money comes to our state and our locality. And then from an electoral process point of view, it would determine how many members of Congress we have. And so what we don't wanna do is lose members of Congress because some people did not uh, fill out their census. And so that is, shows our political strength. And New York has less uh, 
members of Congress or the same amount as Florida, where New York going way back, way back, was number one as far as the number of members of Congress that we send to Washington, D.C. And obviously, many of you know, and some of you don't know, the state with the highest number of members of Congress from that state is California. So California is the largest state than New York State. Uh, and there are several other states like Texas and Florida that's right at the even a little bit more than New York State as far as sending members of Congress. So that's political power. And that's why it's imperative that we vote uh, and it's imperative that we fill out the census. As you know, the census was scheduled to close by September 30th. Uh, a judge ruled uh, that it's gonna be extended uh, to October 31st. So we're still gonna be out there doing census. But as far as voting is concerned, I tell people, well, you have three ways to vote. There's no excuse. There's no excuse. One, you can vote by absentee ballot. Number two, you can go to an early polling location. Or number three, you can go to vote on election day. So there's three different ways that you can vote. So please don't give me an excuse. I don't have the time. You know what I would say realistically? You know what BS means, right? That's what I would say. And so, and I would say that every vote counts. And I would say, if you don't vote, you don't count. Senator, no. Senator Jackson, if I may, um, you're an education man, so I'm going to throw this question at no. you. I'm a so good you, catcher, you know. You, you mentioned um, congressional seats, but we also know, and we touched on the Electoral College um, earlier today in our conversations, but uh, can you talk a little bit about the Electoral College um, I, and maybe some others on the call, may want to know how New York selects its delegates uh, for the Electoral College. Well, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how the Electoral College's uh, members are elected. I mean, I can Google that. I'm sorry, I don't know, because I don't claim to know everything. I put you on spot. <laughs> that, that's okay. And you know, that's okay. You see what I've said. I'm not, I'm not hemming and hawing. I'm just being very clear. I don't know, but I'll make sure I look up after today. But the bottom line is that those are the individuals uh, that will then cast their vote uh, from electoral college. And there's been some discussion about the, uh, uh, asking or encouraging the electoral college members to vote for whoever has the highest number of votes uh, in that particular state. Uh, so that's a controversy right now that it's being discussed overall. But just like right now, the discussion that's taken place within the Democratic Party, even especially in New York City right now, is encouraging people to actually go and vote. Uh, and I don't know if you discussed that earlier, but because if you actually go and vote or, or on an early voting period of time, which from October 24th to November 1st, and it's different times, but basically every day there's a period of time, let's say 10 to 4, something like that, that you can go vote early at an early uh, voting location wherever you live at, and then um, then you can go vote on election day. Uh, and why are, they, why are Democrats and myself encouraging people to vote uh, in person? Because the absentee ballot votes uh, will be counted over a period of several weeks, possibly a month, and what have you. And so from a, from a strategy point of view, this is what parties are talking about, that you want your candidate at the end of the night to be in the lead from the actual votes that counted by computer. And because that would set the pace uh, for your party, whether it's the Democratic Party or Republican Party or Working Families Party or Right to Life Party or Green Party. And there's like, there's like seven parties uh, in New York State that are actually uh, on the ballot. And so that's important overall uh, with respect to we are encouraging people to vote uh, early uh, in early election. And obviously, you know, this is going to be a very controversial election. So people said, don't wait to the last minute because you may go there. The lines may be around the corner on, on voting day. So if you can vote early for the seven or nine days prior to the actual election day, I would encourage you to do so. But obviously, if you don't want to go, you have a right to then vote by absentee ballot. And we encourage people to make sure you understand that the ballot itself, 
you must sign. And I believe there's a date on there also. So you must actually sign the ballot and then put it in an envelope, an outside envelope that's mailed to the Board of Elections. And whereas in Democratic primary before, there was a self-stamp address envelope. This time, there is no self-stamp address. And so you have to put a stamp or two stamps on it. And then it has to be received by the Board of Election by a certain time. So if you vote in person, then that's better in my opinion. But obviously, if you got an absentee ballot, you can go to an er early voting location. There's a, a, a drop, a, a absentee ballot drop box and you can drop it actually in the box. We're at the early voting site or on election day. So from a process point of view, that's what the encouragement is overall. Dep doesn't matter who you vote for. Thank you so much, Senator. Um, I've been here since November and have um, every time we act has called for your support, you have been there. I have seen you and we were in Albany and you just show we had so much love. You were at our uh, membership meeting on housing. So I truly, personally, and on behalf of WE ACT and our members, just want to say thank you for all the support and all the leadership that you provide and moving the critical work uh, that we do in the Senate. Um, so thank you so much. And you provide a great um, transition. Let's talk strategy. What, as WE ACT members, can we do uh, this November and for the 2021 election to make sure that our votes count and that we raise our issues. And so without further ado, we are going to close out with my co-worker, Christopher Casey, who is going to run through our 2020 and 2021 vote engagement campaign. Thank you. And I'm going to listen to Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And actually, I just wanted to, to answer your question, Marquise, about how the electors are decided. So just for everyone to know, they're decided by the number of house representatives that you have in your state. And so that's connected to, as you said earlier, the census. So if you don't all fill out the census and lose you know, members of Congress, then we could lose electors, right? So that's why it's really important. All right, well, I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to speak to all of you today. Thank you um, to Senators Jackson and Serrano, uh, Assemblywoman uh, Dinkins and Councilwoman De La Rosa, Attorney Ross and Attorney, um, uh, Gordon, Gordonberg, I'm sorry if I messed that up, Haley. Um, I'm really thrilled to speak to all of you today. And mostly again, just thank you all the members for joining today. So I'm gonna just quickly go through some things about our election, both 2020 mostly and 2021. I do wanna stress the stuff that I'm gonna talk about in terms of election 2020, you've already heard. Um, and it also is mostly focused on folks that live here in New York. And so we are gonna be translating this, so I'm gonna to try to speak slowly, which is kind of hard for me, <laughs> um, but I'm definitely gonna do it. So the first thing I wanna say is we're gonna talk about three things, uh, hopefully in the next 10 minutes. The first is you know, making a plan to vote. The second is essentially our plan and what WEAC members are gonna do collectively to mobilize the vote. And then I'm gonna to touch very briefly on the plan that we have for 2021. Okay, so I do want to stress also there is a site that I'm going to say a lot here, the We Act Vote site. That site has a lot of the information, not all of it, but a lot of the information that you've already heard today regarding, um, you know, uh, you, you, you know, figuring out where your, your absentee ballot is, ordering it, um, that sort of thing. Okay, and so it's the We Act site. I'm just going to keep saying that, and I just want to make sure everyone has that. All right, so. Let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I wanted to talk through with all of you is how important it is that we take action as a movement. As you heard from uh, uh, Assemblywoman, Assemblywoman Dinkins, we really do need to take action as a movement on the issues that we care about because our very democracy is on the line. And so I want to stress to everyone today to please make a plan to vote today. Some of you have. Some of you haven't, some of you are in the process of it. Please make a plan to vote today, okay? And essentially, <clears throat> uh, let's go to the next slide. The one thing I think the core elements of making your plan are essentially the following. You wanna first check if you're still registered. And you can go to our weact.org slash vote site and check for yourself if you're registered. 
That's really important. I'm not gonna explain why, but you definitely wanna make sure that you're on the rolls, okay? Um, as Senator Jackson and others said today, the other thing to keep in mind is if you've recently registered, you wanna check that you're on the rolls, okay? And on the site that we, the weact.org slash vote site, there's a way to check if you are on the rolls, okay? Uh, so they keep that in mind. The second thing you wanna, the third thing you wanna think through is sort of voting early. As the Senator said, it is incredibly important to do so for lots of different reasons. Um, and as Haley said, you know, you can, we can start voting on the 24th and it ends on the 1st, okay? And also, as she said, it, the, your sort of early voting location and where you sort of normally vote if you vote on election day, they are different, okay? They're going to be different. And while not all of the early voting locations are up on the various sites here in New York, a good deal of them are. So please do check our weact.org slash vote site to determine if your actual early voting site is up. It is in my neighborhood. It's not in my partner's neighborhood. Okay, so you definitely wanna check. The third thing is voting by mail. Um, you really do want to apply for an absentee ballot today if you have not done so. As we said earlier, October the 27th is the deadline for, for applying and then receiving the, the ballot. What we are suggesting to our members is that you apply now, today, <laughs> and that you turn it in. You can either drop it in, as we were saying earlier, in the early voting sites or a Board of Elections office, <clears throat> or you can mail it. But we're really encouraging everyone because of the postal issues that we're facing that you try to do this by the 19th so that your vote is counted. I'm not saying for a moment here that if you do it past the 19th, it won't be counted. But as the postal office has said itself to states, they really prefer people to do it much earlier than the official deadline of that state. And again, the official deadline to both apply for an absentee ballot is October the 27th. And then of course there's voting in person, um, which is what I'm going to do. Um, voting in person, again, November 3rd, don't let anyone on any site, anywhere tell you it's different. I um, mean, as we said earlier, the polls will open at 6 a.m. and they will close at 9 p.m. And if you're in line by 9 p.m., you, you have the right to vote. Just keep that in mind, okay? Uh, let's go to the next slide. So there are gonna be a few issues um, in terms of our election that you might deal with and, and Haley did go through some of these. I think there are likely just going to be three for most people. The first is you're a first time voter, you're not on the rolls or you didn't receive a ballot yet. If you are a first time voter and you didn't provide a mailing address when you registered, you definitely wanna make sure that you bring one with you, some proof of address if you're a first time voter, if you early vote or you vote in person. So if you're a first time voter, didn't provide address, please bring some form of proof that you have, you are who you say you are and where you live. That can be a cell phone bill or a bank statement. There are many other things, but those two I think most people have, okay? The second is you're not on the rolls, right? <clears throat> As Haley said, you can definitely, if you've thought, if you think you're registered and you're, or maybe you're in a different place, you can go to the polls and cast a provisional ballot. But similar to like your first time voter, you're gonna need to provide proof if you uh, provide that, if you cast such a ballot, that you live where you live and you are who you are, okay? The third is you didn't receive your ballot. I have several friends here in New York and across the country that have applied for absentee ballots and they have not received them, okay? Um, hopefully you will receive them. It's my sense that most people will, but it is possible that you will not. If you don't receive an absentee ballot, the obvious thing to do is to vote early or vote on November 3rd, okay? It's totally fine to do both. Okay, next slide. So I am going to talk a little bit about sort of what we're going to do to mobilize the vote here uh, in New York City and amongst our members. Our goal really is to mobilize both our members and those who are interested in the issues that we care about. And so there are sort of four opportunities and, and sort of volunteer opportunities that I would love for all of you to be a part of. The first is to join our voter contact team. All that is, is we're going to be phone banking, <coughs> excuse me, and text banking um, both our members 
and members of the public to make sure that they vote. Okay, and we're going to do those text bangs every Saturday starting the week of the 13th. So next week, the first one will be Saturday. And then on the 29th, I'm sorry, on Saturday the 29th, we're going to be doing a huge GLTV uh, phone bank. And that is everyone that we've been calling up to that point, we're going to call again <laughs> and make sure that they have a plan to vote. They know how to vote and answer their questions to make sure that they actually vote. Okay. Uh, next slide. Please join our social team. Um, some of you may have some issues calling people and that's totally fine. Um, but we are gonna be doing a lot of election content similar to what you're seeing today about how to vote and when to vote and absentee ballots and all the deadlines and just all that jazz, right? We wanna make sure that people have that information and the best way to do that is to disseminate that information through some content we're producing. And so we would love for you to join our social team and what you would just simply be doing there is every Monday and Wednesday and Friday, we'll send you the tweets or the social media posts, the Facebook posts, what have you, and we just ask that you set, you share that with your network. Uh, next slide. <coughs> the other thing we're gonna be doing is we do need help with data. As you might imagine, we're contacting a lot of people. We've been registering voters as well. I see some of you, some of the members that have joined me in our registration drive. Hi, I'm so thrilled you were able to join us. We're collecting lots of data and we're gonna just need help <laughs> um, managing it to make sure that we get the right people when we contact them. And so, and I wanna be clear, all the things that I've mentioned, being on the data team, being on the social data team, being on the voter contact team, these are things that you can do from the comfort of your home. You just need a computer, you know, a phone and internet access, okay? And if you don't have any of those things, there are stuff that I can do for you as well, all right? Okay, um, we're coming towards the end here. We have exactly one minute. Let's go to the last slide. Um, again, this is our site for everything, weact.org slash vote. There you'll find information about everything that we've discussed in this call today or in this Zoom meeting and this campaign for 2020. Um, please go there and look at everything. And if you wanna, wanna volunteer almost 45 of you have already, please do sign up there, okay? And then I finally just wanna talk a little bit about, just very br briefly, that in future, in a future membership call, likely the next one, I'm gonna preview our 2021 strategy. And it's gonna be very similar to what we're doing in 2020. And in fact, I would say 2020 is almost like a test for what we wanna do, but the fundamental components of that plan is to work with NYCHA residents to register voters, mobilize voters, educate and inform voters to turn out the vote for candidates that will support our movement's issues and specifically uh, improving NYCHA <clears throat> for its residents. I'm really looking forward to re uh, talking about that plan with all of you and I want your feedback on that plan so that we can make sure it's a really good one. Okay, all right, so that's something that's coming. I'm really excited about this. I'm sorry I went almost went over, but we are at time. Thank you, everyone. If you're going to register, uh, if you're going to volunteer and be a part of this process, I look forward to seeing you out there. And please, as, as uh, the Assemblywoman said, vote, 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 like your life depends upon it. All right, everyone, thanks so much. And I'll turn it back over to Marquise. Thank you so much, Christopher, for sharing that crucial information. We are building our army and you are leading the way. So I am just grateful to be standing side by side and working with the members to make this happen. Um, I'm just gonna close us out very quickly. Uh, so upcoming membership meetings. We have two more membership meetings this year. November 14th, we're gonna be focusing on maternal mortality. And December uh, 12th is going to be our annual meeting where we're gonna look back at all the things we accomplished this year, look forward to all the things that we wanna accomplish next year, and just celebrate being together and making it to another year or making it through the year. Also exciting, it's the We Are Gala. We're gonna be focused on advancing a just transition. This gala is taking place on October 15th. Guess what? As a We Act member, your tickets are only $25. I don't know if you had a chance to go look at the other prices that people have been paying up to the tune of $250. 
This is a really good discount for our members. So uh, please, please, please hurry up and go get your tickets for the membership meeting. It's going to be the first time ever that we do it on Zoom. So I'm excited about that. As you are purchasing your ticket and make sure you get that, 20, that discount, please, on the um, registration page, please use the promo code member gala that's all one word that's m-e-m-b-e-r-g-a-l-a -E member gala and then finally uh before we close out i'm gonna close out with that amazing song that Haley wanted to share but i did want to open up to give our membership planning committee member uh gwen a chance to make a quick announcement uh, so, Gwen, I'm going to give you the floor uh, for 30 seconds. Oh, hi, everyone. Uh, I thought you had the flyer. May I share the flyer real quick? Yes. Okay. Let me see if I can share. I'm not too good with this guy, so uh, let me try. <laughs> if I can't do it, um, don't worry about it. Um, uh, I'm not good with this uh, sharing this stuff. Um, so let me just direct you where you can go and find more information. Uh, we have a wonderful exhibition coming up at the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum. And the exhibition is entitled Unspoken Voices, Honoring the Legacy of Black America. The Dykeman Farmhouse uh, some of you probably know it was on 204th and Broadway, but it was a part of the Dykeman family. And so we're bringing to life the historic portion of the farmhouse to an exhibition, myself and two other artists. So I hope you guys will go to the website and check it out. Um, I myself am creating mixed media pieces. And it's important to know that there were enslaved and free African-Americans who contributed to the farm and its legacy as well as to America. So the exhibition is opening October 20th at the Dykeman Farmhouse and you can go to their website, Dykeman Farmhouse, I think museum.org, but you can Google it. But please join us because there will be certain visitation and also it's gonna be virtual and it's gonna really be some great artwork on, on um, display. Thank you.